A very good evening aspirants. We are happy to announce that the Shankar IAS Academy is launching the Mains Booster 2023. Under this, you will be provided 40 Mains Oriented Tests in 90 days. The booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your Mains scores. And it starts on October 31st and will include sectional tests, half papers and civil service examination emulators. It is available in both online and offline modes for just 4,500 rupees. Grab this chance to kickstart your mains preparation and with this happy note, let's start our Hindu newspaper analysis for today. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. Now without wasting much time, let's get into the discussion. Take a look at this article. It talks about the usage of stem cells to tackle rare genetic diseases. Through this discussion, we will learn about the basis of stem cells, then its properties and also about some of the uses of stem cell therapy. Okay. Now first, let's see about the stem cells. Stem cells are unspecialized cells of the human body. Here note that there are two types of cells present in the body, which are the specialized and unspecialized cells. Specialized cells have specific capabilities that allow them to perform certain tasks. For example, take RBC or the red blood cell. It contains hemoglobin that allows it to carry oxygen. But if you take stem cells, they have unspecialized capability. That is, they can differentiate into any cell of an organism and have the ability of self-renewal. Here self-renewal means the ability to divide and make an indefinite number of copies of themselves. So stem cells can be used to produce any other cell type in our body at times of need. Here you have to note that the stem cells exist both in embryos and adult cells. So now let me sum up the properties of stem cells for you. First they are undifferentiated cells which can turn themselves up into differentiated cells. Secondly, they are capable of self-renewal. Then thirdly, they are present in both adults and children. So these are all some of the properties of the stem cells. Now let's see the different types of stem cells based on stem cells formation at different times of human lives. So here there are three types. One is embryonic stem cells, and the other one is adult stem cells and the last one is the induced pluripotent stem cells. Firstly, let's take the embryonic stem cells. They supply new cells for an embryo as it grows and develops into a baby. These stem cells are said to be pluripotent which means they can change into any cell in the body. Then comes the adult stem cells. Adult stem cells supply new cells as an organism grows and to replace cells that get damaged. They are said to be multipotent. Here multipotent means the cells have the capacity to self-renew by dividing and to develop into multiple specialized cell types present in a specific tissue or organ. For example, blood stem cells can only replace the various types of cells in the blood and skin stem cells provide the different types of cells that make up our skin and hair. Okay. Now coming to the induced pluripotent stem cells. The induced pluripotent stem cells which is also shortly called as IPS cells are the type of stem cells that scientists make in the laboratory. See induced means they are made in the lab by taking normal adult cells like skin or blood cells and reprogramming them to become stem cells. Just like embryonic stem cells, they are pluripotent so that they can develop into any cell. Now talking about the significance of this induced pluripotent stem cells. Firstly, these cells can be created from the tissue of the same patient who is going to receive the tissue or organ transplantation. So this helps in avoiding immune system rejection. Then we can avoid the possible ethical implication issues. Because those cells are harvested only from a willing adult without harming them. Also these patient specific cells can be used to study disease outside a living organism. Then it is also used to test drugs on a human model without endangering anyone. 
and hopefully it will act as tissue replacement for diseased and damaged cells in our body now coming to stem cell therapy see stem cell therapy can be defined as a type of regenerative medicine in which stem cells can be guided into becoming specific cells and these can be used in people to regenerate and repair tissues that have been damaged or affected by diseases so i am going to discuss two of the present benefits of stem cells to make you understand the importance of the stem cell therapy see stem cells can be used in the treatment of cardiovascular diseases here cardiovascular illness can deprive the heart tissue of oxygen causing the formation of scar tissue which then alters blood pressure or blood flow itself then according to research stem cells from adult bone marrow can differentiate into those required to repair the blood cells and heart and this is due to the secretion of numerous growth factors okay so first use is it can be used in the treatment of cardiovascular diseases now coming to the second benefit stem cell therapy can help heal incisions and wounds caused in our body studies have discovered that stem cell therapy can help enhance the growth of new healthy skin tissue then stimulate hair development after incisions or loss and then it can help substitute scar tissue with newly developed healthy tissue so these are some of the present uses of stem cell therapy see there are lots and lots of uses for the stem cell therapy the stem cells have the potential to treat many diseases like diabetes cancer then parkinson's alzheimer then they can be used in curing genetic disorders here i can quote the example of using adult stem cells for the purpose of treating genetic diseases see the bone marrow transplants and the hematopoietic stem cells within are used to treat genetic and acquired diseases of the blood and immune system then the new developments include genetic engineering of hematopoietic stem cells to cure some genetic diseases see what is meant by this hematopoietic stem cells they are multipotent primitive cells that can develop into all types of blood cells including myeloid lineage and lymphoid lineage cells okay and these cells can be found in several organs such as peripheral blood bone marrow and umbilical cord blood okay so that's all about this news article in this news article discussion we saw about stem cells then its properties and how it is used in stem cell therapy then what are all the benefits of stem cell therapy and what are all the developments it is bringing in the near future see this is a very important topic under science and technology that is why we took this much effort to cover this stem cell therapy because you very well know as an aspirant stem cell therapy is repeatedly asked in your preliminary examination and not only this regarding this mains oriented question also can be put up in the future so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see take a look at this article it talks about the multidimensional poverty index the article reports that in india the incidence of poverty fell from 55.1 percentage to 16.4 percentage this they are saying in the span of 2005 to 2021 and the article also says that now sub saharan africa has the highest number of people under poverty which is 57.9 crore and for the first time south asia moved to the second position with people under poverty declining to only 38.5 crore out of which nearly 22.8 crore people live in india so this is the crux of the news article given here In this context no let's discuss an important topic which is poverty in the main angle and then we'll cover the multidimensional poverty index and its recent report okay see first of all what is the definition of poverty see poverty is a state or condition in which a person or community lacks the financial resources and essentials for a minimum standard of living that is the day to day life they don't have enough that is the meaning here okay in simple words you can say that poverty means that the income level from employment is so low 
that basic human needs can't be met. Now the next question that arises is what causes this poverty? See in India, the colonial past, then the population explosion, limited resources, weak institutions, corruption and lack of education and literacy are the main causes of poverty. See take for example the colonial past. Because of this, several land reforms are yet happening and which is in a way keeping the poor still poor. And we all know that we stand second in the world with regards to population. See, with the limited resources, no, if the population is exploding, what will be done? The poor will get only little and the rich will get more. So, this is creating a divide of rich poor. Okay. And adding to this, the lack of education and literacy is creating lack of employment. And when there is lack of employment, you don't have income. And when you don't have income, the nation's growth is in a way affected. Because there will be less investment. And when there is less investment, there will be low productivity. And again, this causes low employment and this causes low income. So, this is getting into a vicious cycle. So, we can conclude that getting into the trap of poverty is very much dangerous. And having seen about poverty and its causes, now let's see two types of poverty, which is absolute poverty and relative poverty. See, absolute poverty means the household income is below a necessary level to maintain basic living standards. For example, the food, shelter, housing, I'm saying, okay? And based upon this only, we are making a comparison between different countries. We are saying they are rich countries and this is poor countries. Am I right? And this is all based on absolute poverty. Then what is related to poverty? See, it is defined from the social perspective. That is, living standard compared to economic standards of population living in surroundings. Hence, you can say that this relative poverty is a measure of income inequality. Okay. For this, I can say the example as comparing myself with another person's income. So, this is what we call it as relative poverty. Both are having basic standards of living, but we are comparing so as to improve. When I compare with the next person, my income is low. So, I am saying I am poor when compared to that X person or someone. Okay. This is what we term as relative poverty. Now, let us see about multidimensional poverty index. See, the first question is, who is releasing this multidimensional poverty index? Can we believe it or not? Yes, we can believe this and we can take this as an accountable index because it is annually released by UNDP and OPHI. What does UNDP means? Yes, it is United Nations Development Program. Then what does this OPHI means? It is Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Okay. These both are only releasing this multidimensional poverty index. See, what they do is the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index constructs a deprivation profile of each household and person through 10 indicators. The 10 indicators are brought under three different categories such as health, education and living standards. The detail about the indicators within each category are given here in the flow chart. You have to pause the video and have a look at this. See, this is very much important because with regards to your preliminary examination, directly this might be a question. Because they are putting the indicators as a statement type of question and asking you about the correct statements. So, have you all gone through the indicators? Now, coming to the calculation mechanism of deprivation score. See, all indicators are equally weighed within each category. Note that within each category only they are equally weighed. Okay. Now, let me explain this to you briefly. The six indicators in the living standard categories have equal weight assigned to them, which is same for the other indicators in health and education category also. So, this global multidimensional poverty index identifies people as multidimensionally poor if their deprivation score is 1 by 3 or higher. So, now this is all about the index. 
Now we are going to see what is said in the recent report. See, it says that India is the country with most number of people suffering from poverty. But the good thing here is number of poor people in India declined from 55.1 to 16.4. This is what I said in the crux of the article itself. Am I right? See, here you have to note that 41.5 crore people exited poverty between 2005 and 2021, which includes about 14 crore since 2015 and 19 alone. And the current population of poor in India is reported to be 22.8 crore. So, with this you would have understood the current status of poverty in India. See, we are saying that we had declined the poverty level. Am I right? Now, you have to understand one more concept in this. The rural, urban, divide and poor population. There also what is happening, you have to know. See, the percentage of people who are poor is 21.2% in rural areas compared with 5.5% in urban areas. Rural areas account for nearly 90% of poor people. See, around 20.5 crore of the nearly 22.9 crore poor people live in rural areas. So, you are understanding the rural-urban divide, am I right? But note that overall the poverty level in India is declining. Now, the question is, how it is declining? It is all through the poverty elevation programs. Now, what does this poverty elevation means? See, poverty elevation is aiming to improve the quality of life for those people who currently live in poverty. So, this is what we term as poverty elevation. And India, the strategy for poverty elevation is essentially twofold. Firstly, an effort is underway to provide greater opportunity for the poor to participate in the growth process. How it is done? This is done by focusing on specific sectors which offer such opportunities. Okay. Secondly, the poverty elevation and social sector programs have been strengthened and restructured with special programs for the weaker section of the society. So, in the second method, what India is doing is it is concentrating on the weaker section of the society by special programs. Whereas in the first method, it is giving opportunity to everyone and especially it is making the poor to participate in the growth. That is what happening in the first method. Okay. So, by applying these two strategies only, the poverty elevation is carried out in India. Now, while discussing about this, let me quote you just two examples about the poverty elevation program. One is the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act of 2005. See, we very well know about this, right? M.G. Narega. The act provides 100 days assured employment every year to every rural household. And one more thing I can relate here. The National Rural Livelihood Mission. It evolves out the need to diversify the needs of the rural poor and provide them jobs with regular income on a monthly basis. For example, you can take the self-help groups which are formed at the village level to help the needy. See, I have just quoted only two examples here. Now, as a homework, take it seriously and try listing down all the other poverty elevation program in India. See, it will be very much helpful while writing for your mains. Because when you are quoting such examples of the poverty alleviation programs, you are proving that the poverty in India is declined through its action. So, this is adding an edge to your answer. That is why I said, take it seriously and list down the other poverty alleviation programs and go through it. At least know what is the program's aim or mission or vision. Okay. That is more than enough to write for your mains examination. Also, it will be very much useful for your preliminary examination because you are going through all the recently occurred schemes. Okay? So, that's all about this news article. See, in this news article, no, we had covered what is poverty, then the poverty elevation program, then we saw about the multidimensional poverty index, then the recent report on it, so, as a whole, I can say we had covered an important topic, poverty, which is important for both your problems as well as means. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this editorial article. It talks about cyber attack. 
The author said that the world is now facing a new danger that is the cyber threat and in that the military assets are the most targeted one. And note that it doesn't stop with military assets, it has also targeted the civilians. He also spoke about grey zone warfare. What is this grey zone warfare? See, grey zone warfare can be broadly defined as the exploitation of operational space between peace and war. This is to change the existing state of affairs regarding social or political issues through the use of coercive actions. Here note that the operations involving grey zone warfare are called grey zone operations. And the author said that the grey zone operations have now become the new battleground that is true especially in regard to cyber warfare. And the cyber warfare is already being employed to undermine the vitals of a state's functioning. For this point, he highlighted the use of cyber warfare in the recent Russia-Ukraine war. So this is the overall crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about cyber attack, the threats created by it and then about the cyber security and finally we will see some of the policies and programs related to cyber security in India. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. Kindly go through it. First, let's start with cyber attack. See, a cyber attack is any attempt to gain unauthorized access to a computer or computer network with the intent to cause damage. Cyber attack is aiming to disable, disrupt, destroy or control computer system or to alter, block, delete, manipulate or steal the data held within these systems. Okay? And know that any individual or group can launch a cyber attack from anywhere by using one or more various attack strategies. Also note that people who carry out the cyber attacks are generally regarded as cyber criminals. So while talking about the cyber attack, you have to know the important types and threats of the cyber attacks. Firstly, take the malware. It is otherwise called as malicious software. It refers to any kind of software that is designed to cause damage to a computer, server or computer network. Here ransomware, spyware, worms, viruses and trojans are some of the varieties of malware. Secondly, take phishing. It is the method of trying to gather personal information using deceptive emails and websites. What happens here is, through spam emails or websites, they are trying to get all your information that is available on that device. And thirdly, take the social engineering. It is an attack that relies on human interaction to trick users into breaking security procedures. This is done in order to gain sensitive information that is typically protected. So this is all with respect to types and the threats caused by them. For you to understand a little more, let me give you a few examples of cyber attack that happened in India. Firstly, take the Union Bank of India haste that happened in July 2016. See through a phishing email note that was sent to a Union Bank of India employee, the hackers accessed the credentials to execute a fund transfer. And what they did is they transferred money of about $171 million illegally. Then the timely and prompt action helped the bank to recover almost the entire money. And secondly, you can take the example of WannaCry ransomware attack which occurred in May 2017. See, it is the global level ransomware attack that took its toll in India also. The several thousand computers were got locked down by ransom seeking hackers and later on the issue was resolved. See here I have given you two main examples of cyber attack that happened in India. A lot more examples are there to describe cyber attacks that happen all over the world or in India itself there are lots of cyber attacks. But I have just given you two for your understanding. You can go through the other cyber attacks also. Okay. See, why we are giving such example is to give an edge to your main answer. Because just defining the cyber attack and saying these are the threats caused by it is not sufficient. Whenever you quote it with an example, it will really add an edge to your main answer. Okay? And knowing about different types of cyber attacks that had occurred recently is very much useful for your preliminary perspective also. Now let's see what is cyber security. 
Cyber security is the practice of defending computers, servers, mobile devices, electronic systems, networks and data from malicious cyber attacks. So in simple words I can say cyber security is a practice of preventing one from the cyber attacks. Now let's see what is defined by the term cyber crime. See cyber crime is a criminal activity that uses a computer or a computer network or you can say a network device. To commit crime. Most cyber crime is committed by cyber criminals or hackers who want to make money. Not only for money, they also do it for other political or personal motives. Okay. Here for example, you can take hackers who are using videos or photos of someone else for earning money or posting them in the websites without the knowledge of the concerned person. See in this example now, the hacker is doing this for his or her personal motive. So if this kind of theft is done, this is what called as cyber crime. Now comes the term cyber warfare. See cyber warfare has been defined as actions by a nation state to penetrate another nation's computers or networks. What for they are doing this? This is for the purpose of causing damage or disruption. See, it also includes non-state actors such as terrorist groups, companies, political or ideological extremist groups and transnational criminal organizations. Okay. Then what about cyber terrorism? See, the term cyber terrorism is defined under the section 66F of the Information Technology Act 2000. It says that all those acts by any person with an intent to create threat to the unity, integrity, sovereignty and security of the nation or create terror in minds of the people or section of people, all these are listed as cyber terrorism. How is this done? This is done by the way of getting access to a computer resource through unauthorized means or causing damage to computer network. Okay. And now moving on to see the policies and programs related to cyber security in India. Firstly, you can take the National Cyber Security Policy of the year 2013. It was formulated for the purpose of monitoring, safeguarding and strengthening defenses against cyber attacks and to guarantee safe and reliable cyberspace for individuals, organizations and the government. This policy also aims to protect the information infrastructure in cyberspace. This is by reducing vulnerabilities and develop capabilities to prevent and respond to cyber threats. Then it also aims to minimize damage from cyber incidents through a combination of institutional structures, processes, technology and cooperation. Then let's talk about the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team, which is shortly referred as CERTIN. See, it is the National Nodal Agency for Responding to Computer Security Incidents as and when they occur. It functions under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and was established in the year 2004. And it was established under the provisions of the Information Technology Amendment Act 2000. And the main functions of this response team include collection, analysis and dissemination of information on cyber incidents, then emergency measures for handling cyber security incidents. Then you can say the coordination of cyber incident response activities. Then lastly, they issue guidelines, advisories relating to information security practices. Then the Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center. See, it was approved in the year 2018. And it is an initiative of the Ministry of Home Affairs to combat cyber crime in the country in a coordinated and effective manner. Then you can take the Cyber Surakshit Bharat Yojana. It was launched in the year 2018 by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. And it is to fortify cyber security system in India with regard to the government's vision of a digital India. Note that this scheme was launched in cooperation with National E-Governance Division and various industry partners in India. Then lastly, take the Cyber Swachthat Kendra which is also called as Botnet Cleaning and Malware Analysis Center. See, it is a part of the Government of India's Digital India Initiative. It also functions under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and it was set up to create a secure cyberspace by detecting Botnet infections in India. And it also helps to secure systems to prevent further infections. 
See what is meant by botnet? A botnet, which is short for robot network, is a network of computers infected by malware that are under the control of a single attacking party known as the bot herder. See, from one central point, the attacking party can command every computer on its botnet to simultaneously carry out a coordinated criminal action. This is what we call it as botnet infection. Okay. So that's all about this news article. In this news article, we had covered about an important topic for your GS3 mains, which is the cyber attack or cyber threat. In this, we had seen what is cyber attack or cyber threat, and we also saw about cyber security and the policies and programs that India had taken with regards to cyber security. And in preliminary perspective, we also saw some of the types of this cyber attack, and then we saw some of the examples of this cyber attacks. Okay, so with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this text and context article. It talks about tokenization. Now suddenly tokenization is a news because the Reserve Bank of India has mandated the tokenization of credit or debit cards for online merchants from October 1. So in this news article discussion let us understand what is tokenization and why it is necessary currently. Before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference just go through it. Now let's begin our discussion. So what is tokenization? See, tokenization refers to the replacement of actual car details with an alternative code called the token. Remember, this token will be unique for a combination of card, the token requester and the device. If you can't get what I am saying, let me explain it with a familiar example. I hope you all would have travelled in a metro train, am I right? So whenever you travel in a metro train, you will be paying the ticket price for the place where you have to reach. And the ticket provider will code the ticket to your destination. Once you collect the token, you will use it to enter the metro station and exit the metro station. Am I right? This means that you cannot use the coded ticket to any other route except the route that you should travel. Likewise, whenever you buy a thing from an online platform, here you can take Amazon as an example. If you prefer to pay through online, you will be provided with various options like internet banking, UPI and payments through credit card or debit cards. Am I right? And if you choose any of the online payment methods, your card details will be saved by that online platform. This is to ease your future transactions. So here the platform is saving the details so that you don't have to enter the card details again and again. And here comes the issue. Imagine someone hacks the platform and gets all the credit and debit card details in one click. It's a nightmare, am I right? See just now we saw about the topic cyber attack, cyber threat, so on, am I right? All that can be utilized to collect your credit and debit card details. And as I said, all the amount will be detected without your knowledge itself. So to solve this issue only, RBI came up with a solution called tokenization. As I said already, tokenization refers to the replacement of actual card details with an alternative code called the token. The token will be unique for a combination of card, the token requester and the device. So how does tokenization work? Imagine I want my cards to be tokenized. So what I will do? I will initiate a request to the respective online platform that is the Amazon. Now what Amazon will do is it will forward my request to the respective card network. The card network with my concern proceed to generate token by sending OTP to my registered mobile number and email ID. Once this process is done, then the token will be generated and saved instead of actual details of my card in the platform. So here what is happening? The platform will know only my token and not my actual card details. And when I visit Amazon again, the token will be there already. I just have to make a click to proceed for payment. This is how tokenization works. 
Now here also you may have a doubt. How will this tokenization prevent me from any data theft? See the answer to this is a very simple one. Earlier I mentioned about a combination with three items, right? That is the card, the token requester and the device. Here the card is mine. The token requester is the Amazon Retail India Private Limited. And the device is the app in which my card details are saved. That is Amazon application. All the three items are very important because the token generated upon request for a specific merchant is unique to a specific card number and is usable only on the particular site or mobile app. That is the token is useless outside of that merchant's ecosystem. Just like the metro token tickets. So even if a hacker or a scammer gets token number of a person, they could not make indiscriminate use of it. And that is how tokenization prevents me from data theft. So if you ask me really such a measure is required or not, it is very necessary. Because as per the RBI annual report 2021 to 2022, in the financial year 2020, there were 2,677 cases of card fraud reported. And this fraud was done through the internet involving 129 crore. While in the financial year 2021, the number of cases decreased to 2,545. It further increased to 3,596 cases in the financial year 2022 with the amount involved being 155 crore. That is why tokenization is important. Also remember as of now RBI has made tokenization mandatory only for the use of credit or debit cards online. For offline merchants, users would continue to swipe the cards on the POS mission as per previously existing guidelines. Okay. So that's all about this news article. In this news article, we had covered about a very important economic topic which is currently going on that is tokenization. See, this is a very big initiative of RBA to address the cyber threats. Especially, we are talking about the cyber threats that is involving the theft of money from the account without the knowledge of the account holders. So we had seen what is a token and how is tokenization mechanism is working. Then what are all the uses or benefits of this tokenization. So I can say we had covered holistically about this tokenization mechanism. So with these key points in mind. Now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here. This article speaks about the India-Africa defense dialogue and the Indian Ocean region plus conclave. See this year no, over 53 African countries have been invited for India-Africa defense dialogue that is happening today and 44 countries have been invited for the Indian Ocean region plus conclave that is going to be held tomorrow. Note that the countries are also going to participate in ongoing 12th edition of Defense Expo in Gandhinagar and will sign memorandum of understandings and transfer of technology agreements with India. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about the India-Africa Defense Dialogue and the Indian Ocean Region plus Conclave in preliminary perspective. Firstly, let's start with India-Africa Defense Dialogue. See, this dialogue is aimed to build on existing partnership between African countries and India. Also, it is aimed to explore new areas of convergence for mutual engagements. And the first ever India-Africa Defense Dialogue was held in Lucknow in conjunction with Defense Expo on February 2020. Note that a joint declaration known as Lucknow Declaration was adopted at the end of the 2020 conclave. And in continuation with this Lucknow Declaration and in consultation with stakeholders, the India-Africa Defense Dialogue now has been institutionalized and to be held once in every two years on the sidelines of Defense Expo. So it is happening this year. Okay. Now moving on to see about Indian Ocean Region plus Conclave. See the Indian Ocean Region plus will consist of approximately 40 countries from Indian Ocean Region. Note that 
the Indian Ocean Region Plus Conclave is hosted by India to promote dialogue in an institutional, economic and cooperation environment that can foster the development of peace, stability and prosperity in the Indian Ocean Region. And note that this will also be held on the sidelines of Defence Expo. So this is all with respect to the India-Africa Defence Dialogue and the Indian Ocean Region Plus Conclave. Now adding on to preliminary perspective, we will see about the Indian Ocean Rim Association. See this association is an intergovernmental organization formed in the year 1997 and it has an aim of promoting economic and technical cooperation. It also aims to create a platform for trade, socio-economic and cultural cooperation in the Indian Ocean Rim area. And this area constitutes a population of about 2 billion people. This association secretariat is based in Mauritius and it is headed by a secretary general. Know that decisions made within this association are reached by consensus and commitments are undertaken on a voluntary basis. Okay. See the organization no, has 23 member states. Who are they? They are Australia, Bangladesh, Comoros. France, India, Indonesia, Iran, Kenya, Madagascar, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritius, Mozambique, Oman, Seychelles, Singapore, Somalia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Thailand and the United Arab Emirates and Amen. Note that the Indian Ocean Rim Association also has 10 dialogue partners. Who are they? They are China, Egypt, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, Turkey, the Republic of Korea, the United Kingdom and the United States of America. And note that this Indian Ocean Rim Association became an observer to the UN General Assembly and the African Union in the year 2015. So that's all about this news article. See in this news article discussion. We thought of knowing only about the India-Africa Defence Dialogue and the Indian Ocean Region Plus Conclave. But taking an edge, we started with the Indian Ocean Rim Association. See, we made it a point to discuss all this because this kind of information can be directly put up in your preliminary question. So when you have a rough understanding or knowledge about these topics, it will be very much helpful for your prelims perspective. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See today we have three questions in which two I will be discussing and one will be a quiz question for you. Okay. Now look into this first question, it is regarding the stem cell therapy that we saw. See whatever portion we haven't covered in that stem cell concept, we are going to look here. Now look at the first statement. Embryonic stem cells are pluripotent in nature. See what is meant by this pluripotent? The term pluripotent denotes the stem cells which are capable of giving rise to several different cell types. So here this statement is correct because embryonic stem cells can give rise to several different types of cells. Okay. And then when you take the second statement, totipotent stem cells has the ability to develop into a complete organism. This statement is also correct. First of all, what is meant by totipotent? See, a totipotent cell has the potential to divide until it creates an entire complete organism. Then what about pluripotent? Just now we saw that pluripotent stem cells can divide into most or all cell types. But it cannot develop into an entire organism on their own. Okay. Then there is one more term. Multipotent stem cells. What is meant by that? See, they have the ability to differentiate into all cell types but within one particular lineage. For example, take the ectoderm. See, it is subspecialized to form the neural ectoderm which gives rise to neural tube and neural crest which subsequently give rise to the brain, spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. So, we can understand that this ectoderm cannot be used to, to produce any other organs except what I mentioned. So, this is what we mean through lineage. So, statement 2 is also correct. Now, look at the question. The question is demanding for correct statements. So, your answer here will be option C, both 1 and 2. 
Now take the second question. It is regarding the multidimensional poverty index. Here also two statements are given and you have to go through both the statements before arriving at the answer. Read the first statement. It is released by United Nations Development Program and the World Food Program. See this statement is incorrect because it is released by UNDP and Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative which is shortly called as OPHI. Note that this World Food Program is a food assistance branch of United Nations and it won the Nobel Peace Prize in the year 2020 for its action in the African continent. Okay, now look at statement 2. India has the most number of populations under poverty worldwide while South Asia has the largest share of poor population in the world. See now split the statement into two. Take the first part of the statement. India has the most number of population under poverty worldwide. This statement is correct. But look at the second part. It is wrong because the sub-Saharan Africa only has the largest share of poor population in the world. Okay, so as a whole, this statement too is incorrect. And look at the question, it is asking for correct statements. So your answer here will be option D, neither one nor two. And displayed here is a quiz question for you. See, if you had keenly gone through the Indian Ocean region discussion, you will be easily able to answer this question, which is regarding the Indian Ocean Rim Association. If you are not listened to this topic, go and watch it and then come back and try to answer this question. And interested aspirants, post your answers in the comment section and the correct answer for this will be posted in the comment section itself. Displayed here are two mains practice questions. Go through these questions and try writing answer for these questions. It will be really helpful for your mains examination. And that's all for today's newspaper analysis. If you like this video, do like, share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.